And welcome everyone to Monster Vision. I'm John English. We have got a great show this week. It's a throwback edition of Monster Vision. We've got a fantastic guest, former Fresno Falcons defenseman John Tengstead is going to be with us. He was a Fresno Falcon from 1979 through 1983, and he's got a ton of great stories to share about his time in Fresno hockey history. So let's not wait any longer. We're going to go to that right now. So we're here with uh, Falcons favorite from the uh, early 80s, number six defenseman, John Tangstead. John, thank you so much for for agreeing to do this. It's, it's tremendous. Well, thank you so much. This is an honor, and I just, I'm just glad to be a part of this. It's fantastic. Thank you. And one thing I didn't mention, uh, this is going to be the the first in a series that we're doing. We're calling the... Uh, the Monster Vision Legends series. So uh, you are the uh, the first of a group of folks that we're we're going to be talking to, and it, it is just great to get a chance to uh, to talk to you about a time in in Fresno hockey that we we don't get to talk about enough. Well, thank you so much, and I'm honored to be here. It's a blast. Thank you. The first one, huh? Yeah, the first <laughs> one. Um, it, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, where did you grow up and learn to play hockey? Well, I grew up in the greater Los Angeles area and ironically enough, um, you know, uh, started down there in, in all the rinks in, in Southern California. It used to be called Glama, which was uh, the greater Los Angeles hockey organization. And then it went to Skaha, which was two different, well, that was Southern California Amateur Hockey Association. And it's, it's ironic because uh, I saw an interview with Wayne Gretzky and his father and he's, they asked him about... Um, you know, how expensive it is now to put a kid in hockey. You know, it's so expensive. And they, he, he said the same thing. My father, he goes, my father would have found a way to do it. And same with my father. And it was so, you know, he would take me to practices in Santa Monica to, uh, you know, all over L.A. And we lived in Orange County at 538, you know, ice time, you know, in the a.m. And so I just I'm so blessed in that area. So that's what happened I, I, where I got all my experience from. And how'd you wind up in Fresno? Well, that's a great story because uh, yeah, I was a uh, junior in high school and my dad was a pharmaceutical salesman and he ended up getting transferred to Fresno. And I said, we are not moving in my senior year. I mean, I went with this class and I was, and he goes, well, you know what, John, they got a pro hockey team up there. And I'm like, Scooby-Doo, like, Bar? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, okay, from that point on, I mean, I never forget the date. It was June 29th, 1979. We drove up. My dad had a motorhome. We drove up, took the Ashland exit off of 99. And I'm like, where are we going? You know? <laughs> and uh, so from that point on, uh, I just dedicated myself. To me, that was like going to the NHL. That was my NHL, the Falcons. So I just did nothing but summer that, but workout and dry land training to get ready. And then uh, lo and behold, then I ended up making the club for the 79, 80 season. Now, I mean, what was that like? Cause you were just out of high school. You finished, finished high school at Bullard, right? And, and you were just saying that uh, you were on the, uh, the baseball team there and uh, you know, very athletic guy clearly, uh, but, but, you know, just out of high school, you, you joined the Falcons and, you know, this uh, 79, 80 season, we're talking the era of Glenn Heinz, uh, Reno and Esco Cipola, um, Greg Taylor. Uh, what was that like an 18, 19 year old kid playing with these guys that are uh, much more experienced grown men, essentially. Um, what was that like? Was there hazing involved? Uh, any, I'm sure there are some great <laughs> stories uh, being a kid and kind of thrown into that 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 group of guys oh absolutely it was uh i was still in high school i was a senior in high school and uh you know for some reason you know by the time i was a senior i was when i was a young in in school i got all my stuff done by the time i got to be a senior so i got in the yearbook class and i already put down like i was going to be on the bullet baseball team and i didn't even think anything like that but for the hockey there was only four of us it was heinzy johnson and me 
Well, three of us from, that lived in Fresno at that time, and uh, we would have to drive to Dublin for, uh, you know, practices on a Tuesday night and then get back to go to school. So we had ice time, like, I don't know what it was, something crazy, like 10 o'clock or midnight or something is when we got the ice time. So I'd get back between 3.30 and 4 and then go to Bullard for that. But, yeah, they called me Rook. You know, Johnson <laughs> would say, hey, Rook, you know. And, uh, oh, yeah, they gave they did me uh, – <laughs> got me good. Yes, sir. Wow. But, yeah, that was, yeah I was the youngest Fresno Falcon ever at 17 uh, by a couple months over ASCO because I – because he was, I don't know, but that's how it worked out. And, and you know, for perspective for today's Fresno hockey fans, I mean, it, you were the age of these Fresno Monsters guys that we're seeing now. Um, it, playing in that league, that wasn't that wasn't typical. You, you were probably the youngest guy in the league, I imagine, at the time, right? You know, I'm not sure, but I think so. I think so, because I know, I know the L.A. Bruins and the uh, teams we had, there was uh, Sacramento Rebels and uh, West Covina. Eagles and yeah, they were all like older men. Yes. So. Talk about that era of hockey in Fresno uh, for us a little bit, because I, I, I mean, I've always had the impression uh, that the movie Slapshot may as well have been filmed here, or might might as well have been a documentary about the PSHL. Uh, it, it, how far off am I there? Well, it's not quite that way, but when I went to Canada. That's the slap shot stories for sure there. Or when you, I think I've sent you pictures when I was a, a Pasadena Maple Leaf, the captain, I looked just, I mean, I had those glasses and everything without the tape, <laughs> but um, no, see, we were the home base team. So all the teams from Sacramento and LA, they'd have to come up and play us in our, you know, at Selland arena. And uh, you know, so that they had a disadvantage right away. You know, we had home mm -hmm. ice advantage, but we had that, you know, we didn't have glass. We had that, you know, the mesh, Around. The chicken wire, yeah. <laughs> so that was always interesting because the puck would bounce off crazy if, you know, if they tried to shoot it in or us, it'd bounce off that. But, the you know, the plane in Selma Arena, it was so open like that. And, you know, the fans, you know, hockey fans are nuts anyway and crazy. And, boy, they supported us. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. It was just – it was so exciting to step on the ice there. Absolutely. It, it, it still is. It, it hasn't changed much. We've got glass now, but uh, <laughs> Selland has, has not changed a lot since you since you played here. Um, it, you, when we were talking before the interview, you uh, you mentioned a few guys uh, on the team that you were close with uh, Mike Dormier or Dormier, uh, <laughs> which which is it officially for the record? Because I know they <laughs> they used to announce him as as either one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, see, the thing was that, uh, you know, it was Michelle Dormier, but uh -huh. his name's Mark, Mike, his name was Mike, uh, you know, Dormeyer, but, you know, rest in peace to him. And there's a picture of him and I together. And I had a perm, my God, I guess, right before that picture. <laughs> I think I sent it to you. And there's them one with me on the individual. But when they announced him, so he was number four and I was number six. So they'd announce either the goalie first, like Nadeau. Then they say Michelle Domier. So I told that announcer, I go, hey, man, why don't you say my name is John Tanksois or something like that? <laughs> but he would, yeah. So with Michelle Domier, he would, you know, he'd say that name and he would, you know, skate real fast and the crowd would just go absolutely nuts. And that'd just get us pumped up and, and the crowd pumped up too. And he was uh, like, you know, he was nobody to mess around with as far as, like, I don't know, he was like our, our uh, Dave Cement going away. But he was a pure, uh, and I think he got his all this down. Most of the guys did in Canada. You know, they got all their uh, skills or whatever. But boy, when he turned it on, unstoppable. And Reno and Esco too. Those guys could fly. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So, so um, who were the guys that you were closest with on the team? Because, uh, you know, we talked about that age gap a little bit. And it might be, uh, you know, might be kind of a little bit difficult for, for you to connect with guys um, on the team with that. Who were some of the guys that you that you hung out with and were close with? Well, pretty much everybody. But it was a uh, boomer, you know, um, Bernie Bronson, because he was. Kind of a lot like me, which still young and everything. But of course, Heinze, Johnson, Lauer, uh, because uh, even though those guys lived in the Bay Area, you know, we'd always go to the Hilton after the games and uh, go up to the top there and, uh, you know, 
do the thing, whatever, with the bar or after the games and stuff. So, but those guys, I was probably the closest to. Because they were like my mentors too. And they were like, hey, kid, you know, they tell me, hey, kid, and Rook, and, you know, you'll get some ice time. Because, you know, it's in, it was the old boys club. They never hardly gave me any ice time. And I'd get the, you know, they'd give you a couple tickets per game and stuff. And I'd give them to my family or whatever. But they'd uh, I'd go to school and they go, I mean, you know, we went to the game and you never, you never got to go on the ice. <laughs> they were, the coach was old boy school and it was reluctant to get me on there. But once, uh, a few games went by and he got me in the lineup and it, it, it's, they sort of won him over to get me more ice time. And the rest is what we say history. <laughs> sure. And, and, and I, I definitely want to ask you about Lorne Nato, the, uh, the longtime coach of the, uh, the Falcons who, um, you know, it, it was one of the original green and gold era Falcons, you know, when the, when the team started back up in, in 68, 69, um, wasn't the coach right away, took over in the second season in 70, um, but coached all the way up through uh, 83 there. But he had just stopped playing like the year or a year or two before you came on board. Uh, he was still playing into his early 50s. What was he like to play for as a coach? Was he, you know, tough guy, demanding guy. What was his style? Yeah, you know, as you bring that up, I'd have to think of that as like a Gordie Howe, how, you know, how Gordie Howe stayed, you know, with it forever and everything. Um, he was a really tough guy as far as, uh, you know, that goes. His son, Larry, was the goaltender. And, um, but see, like he came from that tight knit of guys all in the Bay Area. So they were so close, you know, being up there and everything. So they, that was just a tight knit so when I came in, it was like the foreign foreigner, you know, it was like, well, no, he doesn't go. He doesn't leave the bench. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> so, uh, but one time that brings up a story. I, I don't know if it was that season or the season after that or something, but um, I was like, the benches were, you know, they were so small. You'd have to be standing room only. Like you'd have like six players here and six, six players here. Well, it was coming mm-hmm. to the end of the game. And uh, I was in the back. I don't think I got, I, I was getting so frustrated not getting any ice time, but um, the puck had bounced off the boards right by our bench and, and everybody was standing around and some of the players were coming off. We were changing on the fly. And I remember I just jumped over the boards. And I heard Lauren say, Hey, what are you doing? What the? And then I went down and I scored the winning goal. And uh, boy, when I got <laughs> and back then, you know, they had the bar on the side, you know, on that side. Uh-huh. Everybody could, and my mom had her, her nurse friend was there and stuff, but I ended up scoring that goal. And uh, it's a good thing I did because Heinze comes back and goes, Hey, thanks, Dad. It's a good thing you scored that goal, or you never get to see eyes. <laughs> so that was a few of those players came in there. But yeah, he still was pissed off about it. He still was <laughs> mad. At it. It, it took uh, maybe the following night because we played back to back, you know, it's GM mm-hmm. to calm down. I think to approach me and say, I think he. He kind of got embarrassed. I think he did say something to me. He goes, hey, Tank said, good job or something like that. And, <laughs> yeah, I loved him and, you know, all those guys. And I miss them dearly, the Taylors and that whole group of guys, man. It was something else. What t- good times. Things you mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, L.A. Bruins, uh, and that was always quite the rivalry, uh, pretty much the longstanding one and two teams in the league. Uh most years uh, were the the Bruins and the the Falcons. What was the atmosphere like at Selland when the Bruins would come to town? What was that? What were those games like? Because I remember as a fan, just the the building rocking, just you know, it, it the loudest you'd ever hear it. Multiply that by three when the Bruins came to town. What was that like for you guys? Absolutely. I mean, because that was our rivals and. Uh... I think, you know, at that time, the capacity was 5,500 or some of the largest crowd I played for was a Bruin Falcon uh, playoff game. And it was 4,200 fans in there. And like you said, the thunder, the way that selling is set up and the way the, you know, the acoustics are in that building. Bam. You know, I, I'm just tickled that the monsters are in there because they, they really get that, that experience of that, you know, that, or, but it was intense, you know, because we really didn't, it seemed like we would blow out some of the other teams, but those games were always tight. Two goals, four to two, two, one, you know, it was never, and they surprised me because they were, 
you know, when I grew up in LA, I never knew any of those guys. Heinz, he actually came out of, out of that era too, before he became a Falcon. Mm-hmm. He was, uh, he, he played in all of that, uh, all those teams and stuff. And so I never knew those guys because they were like an older crowd. Like I would be now like huff and puff, you know, league. You know, that's what they call right. it. <laughs> <laughs> What about uh, like guys like Reggie Tebow uh, when he would come into town and, you know, the, 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 the guys that were the, the mainstays in the league that were always uh, when they'd come to town, the fans would be on them a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was interesting because I didn't know anything about Tebow or all this stuff, you know, and then when I, they just throw you in there and you face this guy, it's like kind of like slap shot in that sense that to Ogie Ogatork, you know, the character, <laughs> because that's For what sure. he reminded me of. And then they had a guy from Sacramento was like that, but he was like six foot five, just a monster, but Tebow. And then was, an, I think there was two Tebows. Reggie uh, Ron Tebow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think and, that's and, what I and, remember. And I've never been Reggie and Ron were brothers or father and son or what the deal was. I know <laughs> Reggie was older, um, yeah, but so. it, but yeah, that 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 uh, that family rivalry went on for for quite a quite a while there. Um, so you it, you finished up with the Falcons after the eighty two eighty three season. Am I right? Yeah, that's pretty much accurate because I didn't really get you know I say eighty to eighty four, but those last like 83 and 84 didn't really have any contact with them. I just kind of faded off because uh, Lauer was coaching then. And he brought in uh, like players that he knew from San Jose and uh, you know, defensemen and and like Willard and um, Rogie. So those guys kind of came in. So, okay. and then when, when Frank Freeball came in, see Frank Freeball and I grew up, he played Visalia. And I used to face him in L.A., you know, we'd always end up meeting him for the finals and stuff. But, you know, Frank Freevault was, man, he became such a beast on on the blades and stuff. So it, it boiled down to be like we they would carry usually six defensemen per night. And uh, so we had like eight that would go to practice. And so it just boiled down to Daryl brought in this new plan with, uh, you know, for the breakout play and stuff. and. I don't know. We just didn't seem to think that I could pick it up or whatever, get the breakout. But so that kind of faded yeah, out. Because I was going to say, you know, by Fresno hockey standards, you know, with Coach Nato playing into his 50s, you had another good 20, 30 years to go before, <laughs> before ordinarily, you should be just finishing up now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. But yeah, you know, you're right. But my mindset wasn't for that. You know, my mindset since I was four years old was to go to the NHL. In fact, I told my parents that I was going to do that. And then lo and behold, when that had, that story happened, uh, it was after my first season with the Falcons. Um, if you want to hear it, it's a pretty good story. We were at. Uh, Absolutely. You know, yeah. Okay. Uh, we were uh, we went to this Huff and Puff tournament at Charles Schultz's rink in Redwood City. Now, mm-hmm. you know, Charles Schultz from Peanuts, right? Well, Charles right. Schultz is. Schultz designed that rink. You know, most rinks have glass all the way around the top. Well, his rink mm-hmm. had glass on the bottom. It was really cool. You could shoot the puck around, and then the boards, it was split. Anyhow, so we go up there, and uh, it was for a weekend thing, and these two guys said, hey, we're going to Seattle. Uh, we're going to take you. To, you're going to, to the NHL, John. I go, okay. Well, I only brought my hockey gear and, like, just a couple sets of clothes. So they basically kidnapped me, right? So we get to, like, Eureka, California. <laughs> I call my mom. My mom's all, man, where are you at? And I said, I, I'm in Eureka, California. She said, oh, my God, you're supposed to be going to college <laughs> this, this next Monday, right? And I said, well, I told you when I was a little boy that I was going to go to Canada because you, you can't be seen by the Fresno Falcons. I mean, I don't know how it is now, but scouts don't generally, you know, you, you got to go to either the colleges or to Canada to play major juniors. So that's what I was doing. Mm-hmm. So we stopped in uh, Portland at the Winter Hawks. They weren't available. Then we went to Seattle. and. They said, you're looking at the next Bobby Orr, which is the jersey I'm wearing now. That was my boyhood hero. <laughs> but So then I went to Canada, and the story in Canada was crazy because um, all I had was my hockey gear and, like, six sticks and $10. Well, I got there, and there was wow. one square town. It was a one-acre town, right? It was crazy. And so I 
the training camp didn't start till the next day. <laughs> so I put uh, my gear in the bushes and I spent that $10 at this bar that it was like the pirates bar or something. They had stephaglotites and stagamites went in there. It was like crazy, but I came out and I go look for my gear and I couldn't find, I, I found my glove in a bush. I found my sticks over here. This oh, and that. No. I found, found everything but my skates. And so this is my dream to go play major junior hockey, go to the NHL, and I can't find my skates. Well, the Royal Mounted Canadian Police were right over, like, one part of the town, a little tiny little town. So I went over there. I'm, like, panicking. Like, oh, my God. They go, we're going to get these little buggers. So they went to this little pinball shop, and they saw these little kids. And they go, where's this guy's skates? So in the lo and behold, they found my skates. And I'm, like, oh, thank God. So that night, I just clutched my gear and slept with that. But that was for the Seattle Breakers 2015. <laughs> And I thought every day, John, I thought, man, you know, I'm going to get cut. Okay, so the 240 Canadians tried out for this hockey team. Every day I'm looking at the cut list thinking, you know, because they are they were clowning me because I'm from California. And stuff. oh, he's never made the team, never made the team. Every day I kept seeing my name, it was never on there. So I ended up making the team. It was Kelowna Buckaroos. Now they're called the Kelowna Rockets in the Western Hockey League. But I could not believe it. And then so – I ended up making the team and then they traded me to Abbotsford, which is on the border, Abbotsford Flyers. And the guy, the coach there was a Canadian, like, uh, you know, sacre bleu, you know, he, and so he ended up, <laughs> Oh, I know what happened. They put, they, <laughs> they gave me a billet because in Canada it's, it's huge about billets. I had this Australian mm -hmm. cute little family. No, they were from New Zealand, cute little family, you know, blonde lady with, you know, a couple little kids and stuff. And they were like, Youth hockey, like the monsters or the junior Falcons, you know, they were just like, uh, you know, but I ended up crashing into the goalpost to practice. Like I was flying, I hit head first, like just like slap shot, just boom. So I missed a couple practices. So this coach comes to me, he goes, You know, you're just not the same player that you was over you got alone. So we're going to cut you. So I'm in Canada, right? I'm dejected. I'm walking out of the rink, you know, I'm thinking, Oh no, I got to go home. I didn't want to come home. <laughs> So I'm walking on the rink and these guys pull up in this old truck and they go, hey, you want to go to our training camp? And we haven't even started training camp. And I go, <laughs> like, I got nothing else to do. So I jumped in this truck and we went 800 miles north of Vancouver. And that we were wow. the most southern Gnosis team. And that's when the slap shot stuff starts. But it was Williams Lake Mustang. It was uh, Junior B, uh, you know, tier two at that time and uh that's when the slap shot story came and i never i never saw anything like that you know i mean like i still i'm still 18 years old you know because like the one team to 21 you can have maybe one 21 year old player in canada and same with here i know with usa hockey you can only have like maybe two foreigners and so i was foreigner being an american so that took off from there from that point wow so but, now you mentioned something yeah. about the Olympics. This might come later in your story, but but uh, tell me tell me about the Olympics. The Olympics is okay. So I don't know if uh, if, if you're hockey people, you're familiar with Miracle, the movie, right? Sure. Well, we were mm -hmm. we won the U.S. Uh, gold medal in 1960 in Squaw Valley. That was the last time. So we were 20 years behind the Russians. So USA Hockey said, "Hey, this is what we're going to do to combat this problem." So the movie's pretty accurate. It's almost dead on except a couple little nuances that I know about because I was part of it. So they took the top kids from the East coast at 14 years old and the top kids from the West coast, top hockey players in the nation. So I was in the West coast. Okay. So the top 80 kids in the East coast went to uh, Colorado Springs Olympic training center. I, since I was in the West coast, I went to Squaw Valley and, and uh, that's where they had our training camp. And ironically enough, now I don't don't laugh because <laughs> my hero then was Bruce Jenner, and I got to play tennis with Bruce Jenner in Squaw Valley. That's cool. You know, in between practices, that's very cool. Yeah, and then uh, you know, look at him now. But you know, it's, that's another story. <laughs> but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But yeah, it was interesting because uh, the coach of the his name was Bob Badger uh, Johnson. His son, Mark Johnson, played for the 1980 team. Well, he gets no credit at all in that movie. You know, they give it all to uh, the other guy, the coach. Um, I can't think of his Brooks, name now. Yeah. But, you know, the guy, Herb Brooks. Yeah. Herb Brooks that play, was played by, you know, um, the guy from Colorado. Uh, you know who I'm talking about. Was it, was um, it Kurt Russell? He's married to Golden Hawkins. Yeah, yeah thank Kurt you. Kurt Russell, yeah. <laughs> all right, but yeah, that's so... Got to spend a week there. And so that's how that whole Olympic thing came. So I wouldn't have been on that 80 team 
maybe I would have been, I don't, I think it would have been the 84 team. I'm not sure. I can't remember, but so I thought that was a great experience. And so that's how that, that, that started evolving. So we could catch up to the Russians. And that's and very, that's very, it had, to be a, had to be a tremendous experience. Was that basically like, a, a, I, I, I'm trying to come up with a comparison for that in terms of what that camp would have been. Was that like, almost like when they were trying to put the team together or how, how was that? Uh... No, they were taking us at 14 years old to get the prospects to see where we were gotcha. as USA hockey in the program at that point in time. That was 1976. So they were just getting okay. a look, but as it progressed to Hank, you know, her Brooks, you know, as you see in the movie and the, the, we all know the story and everything at miracle on ice, mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't going to take the, he was going to take the team that you know, he didn't care if he got along, you know, you're, you're going to win the, you know, you're going to, I'm going to skate you to death. It's like here, you know, I live in Vegas now and the, the golden Knights, you know, they want to win the Stanley cup, but so do the New Jersey devils, but you know what? I could get them to win the cup. They, they got to skate. Skate, escape, <laughs> and you know, everything else is in place. You know? uh, looking back at your playing career, uh, is there one thing, uh, and it can even expand beyond just your playing career, but is there one thing that you look back and wish you could do, wish you could go back and do again? Uh, you mean a moment in time? Or sure. with the Falcons? Well, with the Falcons, sure. uh, we were talking about that L.A. Bruin playoff game. Okay, so something happened where one of our forwards was out. Okay, so they put me on the line with Reno, and I'll never forget this. It was it was game one. I think we won the championship anyway. But I'll be, you know you you see those moments where a player is haunted by the miss. Like I found on the puck, it was right there in the crease. A guy lifted my stick or something. And, you know, you don't sleep. You just think about that the whole night or whatever. Maybe that's the one mm -hmm. moment in Falcon, you know, lore that I remember the most. And then the goal I got. And then there was one goal I got that I don't know that I, against a goalie that we grew up playing together with. I think in Laha, we were all stars. But I love that goal because I took a slap shot from way back on the point, you know, and it just hit the bar and, you know, the ring. It ding, and in. And so that, that probably yeah. was. And then the Canada stuff, like I was talking about the slap shot uh, trip, that those moments, you know, I mean, <laughs> we went, I was like, I got to tell you about this. We went to, uh, we were the southernmost city. We were, and we went to this place called Quinnell, our first stop. They were called the Quinnell Millionaires. It was a milling town, right? So we get in there and we got the Calgary Flames uniforms on where, the, where those colors, right? So I knew a goalie that we had tried out for before at those other teams I was telling you about. So there was a big brawl going on in the corner, fighting like slap shot, right? So I see the goalie and I'm like, signal him. So I took this big boom and slap shot. Now this is in their rank and he ducks and he hit the glass, right? Well, I look in the bench and this captain, their captain came over and just like pummeled me, but I just turtled up like this and he was just pounding me like this. So I get back to the bench. My, go my coach goes, Thanks, Dad. If you ever do that again, you'll never wear a red sweater, eh? And I'm like, well, okay, you know, because this is my, you know, <laughs> you know I, I stepped out of line. But then after that, there's a TV show called Dawson Creek. It, it's famous. Mm -hmm. Well, we went to Dawson Creek Kodiaks, and these guys came out. The boards, John, were this high at shoulder length. So when I'm in there, every week I go to, I'm like, you know, skating around at warm ups, you know, look, think, you know, I'm in Canada. I'm like, wow, this is so amazing. This is cool. And my, teammates were hey pay attention but they came out and they were like all cornbread fed football player <laughs> and so we just got you know pummeled every game on the road trip but on the bus like this was like slap shot they have this game called two card guts and you put two dollars in your money just keeps riding well i ended up winning all for my teammates they'd be smoking cigars and all this canadian like phony money i mean you know play money i just go thank you <laughs> i didn't know what i was doing <laughs> So that kind of stuff was funny, man. And it's just, you know, I was like, wow, okay, cool. <laughs> that is great. Now, uh, one thing I wanted to touch on that you mentioned, and, and uh, we have the uh, the photo, and I, it, we'll share it on here uh, if, uh, if, if that's okay with you. Um, you got to have some contact with, uh, with Bobby Orr's family. Uh, you, were, you were pitching a uh, redesign of the NHL logo. Uh, tell me a little bit about well, that. Well, yeah, look, look, this is what I got. The, this is the Orr, see? I wore that for that occasion. Yep. I got to Bobby Orr. He was my boyhood hero. 
you know, growing up. I mean, uh, everything. So in 19, in 2007, let's see, what was it? I think it, no, I don't know. 1996 or 1997, I said to myself, look, every logo in pro sports is red, white, and blue. For uh, the baseball, you got Harmon Killebrew. What did it for me was Jerry West is the logo for the NBA. Okay, so now they've even done mm-hmm. it for NASCAR and everything. But NHL was always like black and orange. Now it's black and white. So I said to myself, well, the mo- to me, the, you know, on May uh, 10th, 1970, was the most iconic, memorable moment in sports history granted i'm prejudiced <laughs> for hockey but when bobby or scored that game winning goal i'll never forget it i was watching it. my dad missed it he went to the store and stuff but it didn't come to me uh until t- i figured out so i took that picture of the, the most you know that goal and then i put it in illustrator and i made it into red white and blue and turned it and uh, never really thought anything of it. I thought the, and I pr- tried to give it to the NHL, not give it to them, but see if they would use it for, you know, in history or moving forward for special events or whatever. I thought they would go for the logo and really like it and stuff. Well, they turned it down because it wasn't anything that comes from the NHL. You know, it's got to be by now. Yeah. So um, what Darren Orr did, his son took me like 25 or 35, I forget how many years, a lot of years in like, Two emails. I was trying to get a hold of Bobby Orr. I wanted him to see the logo to see how he liked it. And all the bad, big bad Bruins from that era, Espo, or the ones that when they won all those Stanley Cups. So um, Darren Orr, I uh, sent, he goes, what do you want to do with this logo? And I said, I just want Bobby to see it and see what you guys think of it and see if he can present it to the NHL to see if it could be, you know, if they would use it as their logo for the NHL or for special events for, you know, because let's face it, Bobby Orr's, you think I would still have him here, but it's not much longer. You know, they're, they're falling like flies and I just wanted him to see it. Well, they absolutely loved the logo. They loved it. And he goes, well, what do you want to do with it? And um, I said, well, I'd like you to present it. And then, so he emailed me back and he said that, you know, his father wasn't interested in presenting it to the NHL. And it surprised me. I didn't know why, but I was, so I, I emailed him back and said, Hey, I put a lot of time into this. I was just wondering why. And, and Cause I thought maybe he would, you know, be like Jerry West and like it, but Bobby Orr just didn't want to be, he didn't want to represent the NHL as, as, as himself, which I thought was really interesting, but I was wondering if he would have thought that way differently back when he was playing or not, but. You probably, know, uh, but. Uh, you know, you, you do hear stories about, about guys like him and kind of being humble about their accomplishments and things like that. So I, I, I would bet I would make an educated guess that that's, that's probably it, that he, that he doesn't feel worthy of, of, uh, of the, doing something like that. Yeah. Of the whole league. You know? Yeah. So, but it was fascinating sure. and at least I got some closure on it because it was frustrating for all those years trying to get a hold of him. So I was pleased with that, but thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. I, I did, had fun doing it, you know, and like you were saying, what did I want to do? Like, I want to give back to hockey, like for the monsters. I'd love to come out there uh, when their season starts and be a part of it. I mean, juniors, it's just, you know, like Glenn does, you know, how he teaches the kids. And so in that sense, you know, I'd love to, but since I had, I had a fire that everything that I worked my whole life for burned up and clean all my hockey gear. And um, I haven't really recovered from that. And that was on Elvis's birthday. Ironically enough, I live here in, in Vegas, but it didn't happen here in yeah. Colorado, but it was on his birthday, uh, you know, uh, whatever it was, um, his birthday and then 2014. And so, uh, you know, I still haven't ever recovered, but I think, you know, God willing, I will be able to eventually get, but I haven't been on skates forever. You know, I've got it up here still, you know, how you think like you can do it. For sure. Like the Bruce Springsteen yeah, thing, you know, like glory days. I did, didn't want to be that guy where, you know, you throw the big speed ball by him, you know, at 80 years old. Could I, could I have done it? You know what I mean? But <laughs> you, you all probably will, you know, that's how, it's just. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So you mentioned you were, uh, you're in Vegas now and you got to do some work on the, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights uh, arena. Uh, you, you, you mentioned, uh, how was well, that? Well, this is the broadcast booth, John. They're, uh, that's at the arena, you know, all the, they got that logo with the, you know, the knives and the sword and the sun and all that stuff. And uh, mm-hmm. It's like, 
don't tell anybody, but there's fake rocks behind, it, behind like <laughs> glass. We put all that in and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's really cool. You know, I, I like, sometimes I go to their practices and when that, when they're on that booth, it'd be like you sitting there. I'm like, Hey, I did that stuff. <laughs> and I worked on it, but that, you know, that was only that small potatoes in the big picture of everything. But I'm, I'm glad they're still going in the Stanley Cup. You know, the Avalanche has been spanking them, but uh, they have all year by one goal. So when, we don't know. It'll be coming back here. But I like to go to the practices. They got a player, the captain. I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, Mark Stone, number 61 in your program, number mm-hmm. one in your hearts. <laughs> but he's got a stick that's a <laughs> mile long. He's the only hockey player I know that skates like this at rest. And it's like way up here. So I came up with this like fake stick, this long thing, and I was going to take it to practice. But he's going to crack up. But it's like, <laughs> I don't know, but it seems so, so I pull for them, you know, and, and, and all, I love all hockey teams. It's not, you know, I can find something good about every team, whether it's the history, uh, you name it, you know, a player or, you know, everything about it. So it's exciting. It's still, but like I said, I want to give back and I don't know, maybe I would definitely want to plan a trip there and come see you and, the monsters absolutely absolutely we will definitely have to have to do that and uh, you know maybe uh, have you on a, a a future edition of the show in person you know yeah that'd be exciting that'd be super fun i'd be honored It'd be awesome decades in the game i'm sure uh there are a million things that i've forgotten to ask you is there anything that you that you want to share before we go oh i don't know i I think we covered a lot of things, but I'm sure there is, you know, as soon as we uh, end the interview, I'll be like, ah, oh, well, but you know, like, I don't know, it's like I talked to you, you know, before this was coming up, it's not about me. It's, I don't want to be narcissistic. You know, like I said, I want to be about the monsters and what they're, you know, and uh, generate the fans to get, you know, get in there and sell that place out. You know, I mean, I've saw the pictures of the logo on the selling arena ice over, you know, it's just, so it's, what it saddens me that I've been, you know, removed from that as, in a way, you know, I mean, like I want to come, it just, I don't know. Like when I see that, I just like, ah, it, just, it makes my heart get pitter, pitter pat. You know what I mean? So kind of like you, Absolutely. you know, the way, you know, you are, you know, you got to have a life or something. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Thank you again for, for doing this. And I, I know we're going to, we're going to continue this at a later date too, because I, like I said, there's, there's a ton of stories to tell and I've got a ton of questions okay. Uh, okay. that I, that I'm sure I'm uh, neglecting to ask at the moment. So, uh, but for now, let's close it up. Thank you so much for doing this. We, we really appreciate Man, it. Man, I thank you, John, too. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll definitely get together soon. Okay. And again, a huge thank you to John Tangstead for sitting down with us. It was a tremendous uh, conversation with him. Uh, stay tuned to the Fresno Monsters social media spaces on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and everywhere else uh, for more content throughout the off season. We're going to have more great interviews and editions of Monster Vision uh, coming up for you, as well as news on the upcoming season. Uh, ticket sales of all things, and so much more. Uh, So keep an eye out for all of that. Huge thank you as well to James Carr and Darren Redmond, our producers for Monster Vision, and the folks at CMAC who helped make Monster Vision possible. Thank you so much. Be sure to like, follow, and share on social media. Uh, We really appreciate that. It helps the monsters out tremendously. Until next time, I'm John English. We'll see you at the rink.